to Harbor Church. Whether you're online or in person, we're so glad you're here with us. We're the Einan family. I'm Derek. I'm Gina. I'm Ava Einan. And I'm Adley Einan. We just want to welcome you and we just want to say how, uh, how much Harbor's been a blessing to us. We, uh, we love the interaction. We love Josh's messages. They keep us coming back every week. He says something so profound and so deep uh, every week. With that, um, enjoy the service. Have a great day. Hey, Harbor Online. Welcome to Sunday morning. We're so glad you joined us. I just want to let you know of a few things that are going on in the next few weeks that you want to be a part of. So first off is our bags and blankets drive starting this weekend and going until the end of the month. So we are collecting some supplies to benefit some of the homeless population who are here in Hyannis. Obviously, you guys know it is so cold already and it's just going to get colder for a few months. And so we want to help those people who are a little less fortunate these days make sure that they're warm and they've got what they need. So you've got a couple options. One, we've already bought backpacks and they are at the church. You can come by during the service or um, during the week, Monday through Thursday, and pick one up. Fill it up. There will be a list inside of things um, to put in there and bring it back to the church anytime before January 31st or you can bring in a sleeping bag or a blanket. So you got a couple options, whichever one is easiest for you. Grab a backpack, fill it up and bring it back or bring in a sleeping bag or a blanket. Um, we just really wanna bless somebody who's um, gonna need it and a little bit of more warmth um, and supplies for the winter on Cape Cod. Second, um, we are having Inside Harbor and membership class today. This afternoon after our services, there is still time to sign up. So you guys um, go online and sign up if you're interested right now. Um, you can go on our website, um, let us know you're coming. Inside Harbor and membership classes are just a way to get a little bit more involved, learn more about who we are and what we believe um, and take your next step. So I encourage you to check those out and sign up and join us if you can. And then lastly, we're having Rooted Night. So this is for our Harbor family to get together, take communion, um, and just have some family time. Um, that is on January 31st at 6 p.m. So mark your calendars um, and make sure and sign up on our website for that as well. Um, all right, let's get into the message. It's going to be an awesome one today. Thanks, guys. How's it going, Harbor Church? Come on, I know you don't want to clap. I'm wearing a Buccaneers jersey, but clap anyways. Get a little bit awake. Uh, I, uh, I know this is tough. It's tough for me, too. Um, normally, at this time of year, I'd always have a Patriots jersey on because we were always in the playoffs, and uh, it's not. But um, someone gave me this jersey, uh, sent this to me. I thought that was really nice, and I really like Tom Brady, so I hope he does well. Just wish it was for us. Um, that being said, welcome to Harbor Church, and uh, other than this, you will only see me wear another team's jersey unless I lose a bet, um, which also happens, happens from time to time. But uh, if this is your first time, if you're watching on, on Facebook or Vimeo or you're listening to this on the podcast, maybe this is your very first time at Harbor, your first time in a long time, my name is Josh, I'm the pastor here. And uh, I'm so glad that you're with us. I'm glad that we get to be together and uh, just kind of dive into God's word a little bit today. Before we do that, I like to ask a poll question. This is just like a little survey, gives you a chance to interact with me, gives me a chance to kind of just see what kind of people are out there. I normally do like little ones that don't matter. Today's poll matters. I know. Serious stuff. Um, and if you're watching online, 
play along. Uh, tell us where you're watching from. One, we want to say hi to you. We've got people watching us all over the world, actually. This has been really cool to see where some of you guys are watching from. But you can play along in this poll as well. Just uh, put up a hand emoji or write in, type in the answer that you like most. And for those of you here, I want you to raise your hand for which one uh, would be your answer, all right? So here we go. You can pick one of these two, and I want to find out today what is your go-to drink? And this is important because there are some people that cannot, cannot go without coffee. That, I mean, like, they might say they like other drinks, but they have to have their coffee. And then there's other people that say it's not, as, it's not that big a deal, and your, your preferred go-to would be one of a, a million other things. Now, we had thought about making it coffee versus tea um, or coffee versus, you know, a soda or a seltzer or something. I'm going to let coffee stand on its own and go literally against anything else besides coffee. There are so many coffee people. Let's see if there is enough of something besides coffee. Now, I know Pastor Ron, he is not a coffee guy, so he's going to be on the anything else. But I want to see how many other people there are that are weird like him, okay? So let's just vote one time. You vote for which one you like. How many of you would say, my go-to drink is coffee? I am coffee. I thought it would be that. <laughs> we are in New England. Keep it up if that coffee usually comes from Dunkin'. Yeah. Okay, so that's got rid of some of you. are like, nah, man. All right, how many of you would say, I'm team anything else? I like something else. Pastor Ron's got two hands up, still, still in the 20% category. About 80% of you were like, I am team coffee. So uh, it, vote online, we'll see where you're at on that. I'm just curious, just always curious. That's what I thought, but some people were like, no, there's a lot of people where coffee isn't their main drink. I would like to just have it noted that I was correct. <laughs> team coffee, you're, that's where we're at. Even those of us that know that it's not good for us, we're still there. All right. Um, once again, it had nothing to do with what we're talking about today, but it does give us a chance to uh, springboard into uh, a conversation where we need to, well, I hope you're awake, um, we need to be uh, able to focus on some things that God has for us. I know a lot of us use the excuse that coffee is how we focus or how we get where we need to be. I believe that God has got some things for us right now, this year, um, that he would love for us to accomplish or to trust him in and a journey he wants to take us on. But so often we're distracted or we're confused or we're angry or we're just on our own thing and we don't see what God has for us. So in this series, and we started it last week, I'm challenging you to refocus, to see some things the way God sees them or the way God wants you to see them. I would imagine that God has taken you through some stuff that if you would just be honest... You, you have some valuable lessons that you left unlearned, and if you would go back and go, God, why did I go through that valley? Why did I struggle through that? How, why, haven't I, why haven't I gotten any, any better at this thing or that thing? If we would go back and look at some of the stuff that's happened, God has taught us some lessons that we just kind of ignored. There is a lot of um, content in the Bible, obviously, but there's some cool stories in the Bible uh, that I think if you look through it, look at them through the perspective of somebody who would be kind of looking back in hindsight, it's kind of a cool way to look at some of these stories. There's a story in the Bible that I'm guessing some of you have never heard, and yet it's the it's the it's the ever the first ever in the history of mankind. It's the first ever recorded instance or record of special ops of a of a of a special group of people going in on a very uh, covert mission, and it goes under the radar. Like, if I had known this story when I was a kid, I would have eaten it up. I don't know why my Sunday school teacher didn't tell me it. It's about a guy, and uh, he hears some news about a raiding army that has come into the area that he lives. And this army has burned down cities and captured people and stolen stuff. And so, what he does, hearing about all these people that have been captured, he, he goes to his own friends and his own house and he takes some of his own men. He says, hey, let's go, let's go attack those guys. They've been running wild, killing and attacking and winning battle after battle. Let's go take it to them, but let's do it covertly. And he gets his men and he follows this large army that has been successful time and time again. The army's been so successful, they're actually on their way home celebrating all of the victories they have. And he takes his very small force of men and he divides it in half. And then they just watch the camp. 
And I think, I have to imagine, he probably would ask people that were coming in and out of the camp that weren't part of that army, but maybe just doing some business that weren't loyal to him. He said, hey, hey, where, where is so-and-so staying? And where do they keep their prisoners? And how many guards do they have? And he just gathered intel. And they just waited quietly, and they waited silently. And then they let, the visiting, they let that, that invading army drink themselves into a stupor. They were celebrating how awesome their victories were. These guys are just, they're living it up. Battle's over. We're going home with all of our gold, all of our slaves. We're great. And he let them live in that way for a little while. And then when they were passed out, most of them, and everybody else was just too tired or too distracted, him and his forces divided in half. They sneak in. They kill that army. They steal the, the supplies back. They let all the, the captives free, and they get out before any alarm is raised. It's this huge, it's this awesome, awesome victory that nobody thought any, that, that it could happen. And it's recorded in the Bible, and it often just kind of gets overlooked. If you've never heard this story before, it's actually, this is truthful. It, it is, not everything I said was truthful, but like, so you're with me. They, they study this passage, what I just described to you, they study it in military schools today because of the tactics that this man used. His name is Abram, who later gets changed to Abraham. And this is the story of how Abraham rescues his nephew named Lot. I want to read to you the, the Bible account. You can go do all the studying on your own and, and some of the uh, other stuff that's out there, but I'll read to you the account that the Bible records for us. And uh, then we'll kind of look at it through the eyes of Abram or Abraham and Lot and what they would have thought going through this. So before Lot is captured and before Abraham rescues him, there's a little bit of backstory and it takes place in Genesis chapter 13. So we're going to go to the book of Genesis. Like I said, it's one of the very first uh, records in, in, of all, in all of mankind of this uh, you know, covert sneak attack that Abraham orchestrates. But it's found in the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. We're going to be mostly in chapter 14, but we've got to have the backstory of Genesis chapter 13. If you don't have a Bible, we'll put it on the screen and you can read along that way. It says this starting in verse 6. Now, you got to, um, I should have given you a little bit more. Abraham and Lot have been traveling together for a long time. Lot is Abraham's nephew, but Abraham has kind of adopted him as his like, son. At this time, Abraham doesn't have a son. Abra Abraham hasn't had Isaac yet. So he has no kids, and he's kind of taken on his nephew Lot as, as his adopted son. They're very close. They've been around forever, and now they've been growing their families, or their, their, uh, their property, their livestock. That God's blessing them, and they're, they're, they just keep, keep growing. The problem is they, their flocks begin to impede on one another. And this is what it says in verse 6. But the land could not support both Abram and Lot. And this is a new area that they've traveled to. It says all their flocks, all their herds, they were living so close together. So disputes broke out between the herdsmen of Abram and Lot. And at that time, Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land. So Abram says to Lot, let's not allow this conflict to come between us or our herdsmen. After all, we're close relatives, like we're family. He says, why don't, he's like, the whole countryside is open to you. I'll tell you what, Lot. You take your choice of any section of the land that you want, and we'll separate. If you want the land on the left, I'll take the land on the right. If you prefer the land on the right, then I'll go to the left. Lot took a long look at the fertile plains of the Jordan Valley in the direction of Zoar. The whole area was well watered everywhere, like the Garden of the Lord or the beautiful land of Egypt. Note, this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot chose for himself the whole Jordan Valley to the east of them. He went there with his flocks and servants and parted company with his uncle Abram. So Abram settled in the land of Canaan, and Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. So these guys were together forever for, for most of all, all that we have in Genesis up to this point. Uncle Abram and his nephew Lot, Abram's wife Sarah, or Sarai, they're traveling together, and there's nomads, and then they begin to grow. And as they acquire more servants and more sheep and more cattle and more camels and all that stuff, they begin to gain wealth. Now they're becoming more and more prominent. It unfortunately causes this tension between them and him and Lot, or at least between uh, their herdsmen and whatnot. 
Abram does something really unique here. You have to understand the culture of the time. The elder male would have had all of the authority, if you will. Lot, by, by the cultural standards, would have had to defer to whatever Abram wanted. Abram had the right as his adopted dad, as his, just as his elder, let alone his elder family member, to say, hey, I'm doing this, you get out. Abram could have sent Lot anywhere. Instead, Abram not only doesn't give Lot less than what he has, he actually gives Lot first choice. This was completely unheard of. Nobody else would have done it, but Abram says, hey man, you pick which one, whatever you want. You pick what looks best to you, and I'll take the leftovers. Heck, we don't do that today. Look at some of you. You're sitting next to the person that you quote unquote love, and if you open up a box of pizza, you'll pick the best slice for yourself. I know you are. You're sitting like, ooh, that one's good. That's how we are. And Abram says, no, Lot, you pick whatever you want. And Lot looks and he sees this beautiful valley that's lush and green. It's not that way anymore because God comes in and destroys it years later after this. But at that time, he goes, man, that looks like the best place for all of my livestock, all of my crops, all of my herds, all that stuff. I'm going to go there. That'll be the best for me. He doesn't think about the fact that he's given Abram a, a more dry land. He's going, I just want the best for me. It's that kid at Halloween, you know, when they put the bowl of candy out, pick what you want. Ain't no kid picking out the candy corn. You're like, I'll take the whole size candy bar and then one for the road, you know. It doesn't matter. It says just take one. That's Lot. He's that guy. But Abram says, no, no, we're good. Here's where it comes back into play. Let's jump into the next chapter. That was uh, the end there. Let's jump into the next chapter. And it says this in Genesis chapter 14. We're going to start in verse number eight. The beginning gives a whole list of these kings and it's Ur of the Chaldees, there's a, the, the Byzantine Empire here, and uh, the Chaldean Empire, these guys, there's, it's just a mess in this Mesopotamia uh, battles that's going on here. But basically what you need to understand is the, the kings that are in the area that Abraham and Lot live in, they decide to stop paying their taxes to the, the king that kind of is running the area. And so he sends his army, which consists of five other kings, to attack the four kings who have stopped paying their tribute. So it's five kings and a big army of about 10,000-ish eh, people versus uh, the four kings. And these guys are the kings of their individual cities, which are still pretty big cities. Um, but we pick up the story after they've kind of invaded and they've attacked a few spots. And they decide, hey, they're going to have one big battle to settle it. Um, and so we're picking that up in Genesis chapter 14, verse number 8. Verse number 8 says this, Then the rebel kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adam, Zeboiim, and Bela, also called Zoar, they prepared for the battle in the valley of the Dead Sea. Those are the kings, by the way, that are in the land that Lot and Abram are living in. They fought against King, I got no clue, Ketelorium of Elam, <laughs> King Tidal of Golem, King Amraphel of Babylonia, and King Arioch of Elisar. Four kings against five. As it happened, the valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits, and as the, as the army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, remember, Lot pitched his tents towards Sodom and Gomorrah, so that would have been the towns that he would have been a part of. As they, uh, as they fled, meaning those guys lost the battle, some of them fell into the pits while the rest escaped to the mountains. The victorious invaders plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supplies. They also captured Lot. Abram's nephew who lived in Sodom and they carried off everything he owned if this sounds really rough to you this was very common this what this happened on small on a small scale all the time small raiding parties 10 20 30 50 guys would go in and steal from little farms and stuff and capture people and burn it down and steal whatever they wanted on a bigger scale you have armies of tens of thousands they would roll in and they basically just burned down bigger cities and took what they wanted and this happened a lot just one, one in and one out. This happened a lot, so it's not as quite as, as uncommon in this time as it would be for us. But it says they did this, and it says one of Lot's men, this is verse 13, one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abram the Hebrew, who was living near an oak grove that, who belonged to Mamre of uh, the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives, Eskel and Aner, were Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, he mobilized the 318 trained men 
who had been born into his household. Then he pursued Ketelorium's army until he caught up with them at Dan. See, look how normal that name was. Dan, got it. There he divided his men and uh, attacked during the night. Ketelorium's army fled, but Abram chased them as far as the Hoba, north of Damascus. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his, his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. So this is that successful story I told you about. This is a, a, a cool like little side note to how Abraham, or before he gets his name changed, Abram, how he operated and what he did. And this is what we're going to look at. But I also want to show you the end of this story or the conclusion of this, this part because it, it teaches us something about especially Abram's character. Verse 17, after Abram returned from his victory over Ketelorium and all his allies, the king of Sodom went out to meet him in the valley of Sheveh, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, the king of Salem and a priest of God most high, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has defeated your enemies for you. We just sang a song about that. This is this idea. This is one of the first ever recorded priests, and he's out there just, just showing hospitality to a guy who risked everything to go and free some people. And so he's, he's showing what the church should be. He's bringing him bread and wine. He's bringing him some food, just trying to be hospitable. Abram says, it says this at the end, then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. That's the first ever tithe that's ever recorded. Now, check this out. The king of Sodom said to Abram, hey, give me back my people who, who, you, who, who were captured, and you can keep for yourself all the goods you've recovered. I'll tell you why that's a weird proposition. You just, just bear with me. The, uh, and then Abram replies in verse 22, uh, I solemnly swear to the Lord God most high, creator of heaven and earth, I'm not going to take so much as a single thread or a sandal thong that belongs to you. I'm not taking nothing, bro. Otherwise, you might say, I'm the one who made Abram rich. I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Aner, Eskel, and Mamre. So this is a weird story if you don't stop and try to break it down, but Here's what I thought is we're doing a series on refocusing and on how you and I can maybe do a better job right now in 2021, blocking out a lot of the crap that is distracting us, scaring us, depressing us, keeping us from what God's best is for us. If we're going to do a good job refocusing, then we need to do what God has called us to do, which is learn from the Bible. So we, can, we, we have the hindsight of, of thousands and thousands of years of looking back on this story. But what if we looked at it through the the hindsight of Lot and Abram. As they walked through this, can you imagine if you were them in that moment? So first off, let's jump to Abram uh, hears about Lot being captured, and he's getting his men together, and they're getting ready to ride out. Meanwhile, Lot is sitting in some you know, makeshift camp, tied up with a bunch of other captives, probably beaten up, probably scared, while all of his enemies, the, uh, the, the guys that have, have invaded his land, they're partying all around him. What do you think they're thinking about? Well, we know what had happened in their relationship a few months, maybe, maybe a few years earlier. It's not been too much time since they had split up. We don't know the exact amount, but we know that just previous to this, they were living in harmony, hanging out. They had the protection of one another, and their flocks were growing, and everything was, was doing well. But then we have this story, so it made me stop and think. What would Lot have been thinking about sitting in that camp? I think he, he would have, one, probably regretted going to live near Sodom and Gomorrah. And I'll explain why some people did that here in a minute, but I think he's probably sitting there going, man, I wish I had a friend right now. Wow. Wow feels pretty alone when when the crap hits the fan like this and I'm sitting here I wish my uncle Abram was around I wish I had some family I wish I had something maybe he began to kick himself in the butt why did I let 
those stupid herdsmen drive a wedge between me and my uncle. Why did I let, I want you to hear me, why did I let other people with their dumb problems and their stupid voices affect me so much and hurt the relationships that I have? You understand where I'm at? Because this is today. This is you and I. I think if Lot could teach us anything, he would teach us and remind us, and he would be sitting there reflecting, do not let external disruptions cause internal divisions. There are so many things going on in the world around us. We are allowing all the crap that is happening break apart families, break apart friendships. It's tearing up workplaces. It's destroying churches. We are so consumed with being, everybody's got to have a voice in our life. We can't focus when we hear all of this. And what it does is it pulls our heart. And if somebody that is supposed to be an active part of our life, a spouse, a child, a parent, a friend, a neighbor, a coworker, if they somehow hear something or feel something different from us, man, we are torn apart because everything around us says you can't, you can't, you can no longer, you can no longer be together. Those herdsmen and their attitudes drove a wedge between Lot and Abram. Lot and Abram were fine until everybody else around them started causing all these problems. This will be true for you. If you're somebody that allows outside influences to affect you, do not be surprised if it begins to deteriorate some of your most important relationships. It says this in trying to protect the church. Paul wrote this uh, to the church in Corinth it's in his first letter, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Verse number 10, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions, no quarreling, no, no disruption to your unity. That's what he's saying. That there be no divisions among you, but that you be not united in the same mind and the same judgment. I'm bringing this up, guys, because I think Satan knows that a church that's divided, a family that's divided, a marriage that's divided is not strong. And it's, it's hard enough when you and the person you love or the people you love or the people you're called to love or the people that you work with, it's hard enough just the two of you dealing with your own issues. You do not need to bring everybody else's issues and everybody else's comments and everybody else's thing in and try to make that part of those relationships. That's not what God's got for you and it's not healthy. And it's not a surprise that there's so many people that are torn and so many relationships that have burned. So I think Lot would be thinking that and he would go, yeah, yeah, I wish I had thought through this. I think Abraham, or Abram, well, Lot's sitting in, in, in a makeshift jail cell in an you know, in a, in a enemy camp thinking, man, <laughs> I don't know why I ever got set, let some of the things separate me. I think Abram might be sitting there going, wow. I was a little jealous that Lot got to pick the best. No, I'm not saying he was. I think Abram had a much better spirit than I would have. But I'm sitting there going, you know, when Lot looked to the east and he picked the luscious green fields, and the, the waterfalls and the crops that were growing fast, and man, like I just looked, he, and it's just all of that. He looked at all of that and he said, man, look how fast stuff grows there. I could grow so many better, so much better crops, and my animals will eat so much more. I'm, my inventory is going to explode. We both look and saw the same thing, and I was trying to be the good guy and let him have it, but then he really just kind of stole it from me. Man, I just thought, I thought it was going to be, I thought he had the best thing. I thought, I thought he had it so much better than me. I think in that moment when he realizes that being gracious and allowing Lot to pick what was better, what he thought was better in that moment, Abram had to just trust God. God, you've got me, even if somebody else takes what, what, I, what looks like the best thing. If somebody else takes the biggest slice of pizza, you need to be the kind of person that says, God still got me. He's not going to let me go hungry. I mean, I wanted that one, but maybe I don't need that one. <laughs> maybe God is bigger than what I think. And I think Abram would have encouraged us that better isn't always best and i want you to hear this because the world has convinced us to become consumed with finding better and better and better in this pursuit of i got to get something better i've got to have it better it eats away at the inside of you like a cancer and what what is truly best for you 
may not be pursuing always having it better than somebody else. Those people usually tend to be incredibly greedy, selfish, lonely, or depressed, or all of those. Because the pursuit of always having, quote unquote, better or the best, leads you into a place that God hasn't called you to. He's called you to be generous. He's called you to be long-suffering. He's called, called you to be gracious. And pursuing what the world tells you doesn't create that in your heart. Think about some of the most rotten people you know. They always want things to be better. They always have to have that. That pursuit will not help you, and I think Abram noticed that. The Bible tells us that we need to be content. We just don't really pay attention to it. In Philippians chapter 4, verse number 12, he says, I know both how to have a little. This is Paul writing here. This is what you and I should strive for. Instead of saying, I have to have the best, I have to have it better, I have to have the thing that, that everybody else wants, I want people to envy me, I want to have the nicest stuff. Instead of having that mindset, this is what Paul says he has. I know how to have a little, and I know how to have a lot. If God blesses you with a lot, be great, grateful for it and gracious for it. But don't, don't die for that. Don't, don't be consumed with it, is what he's saying. I know how to have a lot or a little. In any and all circumstances, I've learned the secret of being content. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need. So here's the thing. Everybody likes to quote Philippians 4.13, but nobody notices Philippians 4.12 is the precursor to it. See, Philippians 4.13 says this, bring it up, I, I, the, whether you've seen it old school or not, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, or in this version, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Very famous verse. I can do anything through Christ. We love that. What was the setup for verse 13? Verse 12, I've learned to be content in what I've got, and when I learn to be content, then I can do anything through God. It's my greed and selfishness and my discontentment that causes me to lose out on God can do anything. I miss out on that because I'm so consumed with I have to have this, I have to have that. The discontentment is something that our culture breeds in us. Yeah. Like it is hard to watch a single show without getting like 15 subliminal messages on how I'm not good enough and I need better stuff. I need everything to be better. I need me to be better. I need, I mean, like, I need my friends to be better, my car to be better, everything. And I, like, I'm sitting there, I'm like, why don't I not feel so content anymore? It's, just, it, it's the only way to get us to consume more. So I think they would have told us that. I also think if we look back, we, we would see something pretty unique. If, if we could go back and we could sit with them, Lot would be sitting in that prison or in that, that, that camp, and he'd be going, you know what? I moved away from the wilderness to a big city. In this day and age, civil, uh, uh, civilization is what offered you safety. What, what Abram and Lot were doing as nomads was the risky thing. To be out in the land by yourself, intense, that made you really vulnerable. If you wanted to be safe, go to a big city because they have big walls and everybody comes together and they keep each other safe. That's why they build the Tower of Babel. That's why, you know, God keeps telling them, spread out, spread out. But they don't want to spread out because it's safer to be in these big cities because they have big walls. So I think in this moment, if you look at Lot and if you look at Abraham, you look at the story, Lot is sitting there thinking, man, I moved to a big city to be protected. I moved to get away from danger. I picked the smartest thing. I'm supposed to be safe. Here. I'm not supposed to have to deal with this crap. This is something Abram should have been dealing with. I was in a big city. I was, I was protected from this. And he's noticing, hey, trouble, trouble always seems to find you, right? Whereas at that same time, Abram is loaded up with all his boys. They're going in there, and he's got, if you, if you study in other scriptures and other uh, um, historical documents that they have on this abram's men this is not all of his servants the 318 this is just the servants that he has trained for this he picked his trained servants and most people record that he let them volunteer he said, hey who wants to go on this and 318 were like we got you boss these guys had their equivalent of martial arts for the day and age and were skilled in warfare and he's riding out in the dark to go attack. Lot is sitting there thinking, 
man, I tried really hard to avoid trouble, and now I'm still sitting in the middle of it. And Abraham is sitting there, or Abram is sitting there thinking, I'm so glad I, I made these guys train. <laughs> man, I'm so glad I'm not trying to go rescue Lot with a bunch of people who've never picked up a sword. I think, I think Abraham's sitting there going, man, I'm so glad that we, we put the hard work in to be prepared. And I think if we can learn from what they must have felt in this moment of having to, to be caught by an attack that you weren't ready for and to respond to an attack that happened on your family, both men would be telling us the same thing. If we could look and learn from Lot's mistake or learn from Abraham's preparedness, we would see this. God doesn't call us to avoid battles. He calls us to prepare for those battles. And this is what the Christian, this is what the average person fails to do on, on most of their given life is to, to be ready. The Bible says to be instant, to be ready to be instant in season and out, to give an account, to know what you got to believe, to be, to be ready for battle. It says this in John chapter 16, verse 33, I've told you all this, just as Jesus saying, hey, I told you all this stuff that's happening. Why? So you can have peace in me because here on earth, you're going to have many trials and sorrows but take heart, I've overcome the world. The church stuff that you see on television where they promise you that all you have to do is love Jesus and you'll be happy and healthy and wise and you'll never have any problems, that's baloney. The Bible is very clear to tell us the world sucks and it's a tough place and you better be preparing for a battle. But what we do is we act like Lot. I'm just gonna try to avoid all of those things. I'm not saying go out and look for trouble, but what we do is instead of preparing, we're just like, I'm just going to really try to get away from those battles. And we spend our time where God has, to take another story in the Bible, a, a giant named Goliath. He goes, listen, it looks scary, but I'm going to do something awesome in you when you, go, when you go take on the battles I have for you. There are some tough things coming, but if you'll take them on, man, I've got some victories for you that is going to move your life in a new way. You're not going to be a shepherd forever. I want to turn you into a king, but in order for that to happen, you've got to go take on a giant. And what you and I do is we look and we go, ooh, that's a giant. Oh, crap. And we do a lot. We're like, oh, I just don't, ooh, I don't, ah. Pastor challenged us to really start reading our Bible. I just, man, I can't do that. Man, I'm supposed to give. I don't know. If I can, uh, man, I got some bills. Oh, I'm supposed to love my neighbor. I don't know. I hate that jerk. You know, like, we, I don't know. Maybe that's you or not. Um, but we struggle because we see something that looks tough and we avoid it. And what happens is the very, those little things that, that look like little battles, they were preparing us for the big wars that are coming at us. And we're not ready. And that's why a lot of us are struggling. That's why a lot of our families are in distress. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 13 says this. Put on every piece of God's armor. Prepare for battle. Put on every piece of God's armor. Why? So you'll be able to stand. So you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you'll be standing firm. You guys are smart. What is that implying happens if you're not prepared? If the prepared person who has on all the armor gets to be standing firm at the end of the battle, what do you think the inverse is? If you're not prepared, if you're pulling a lot, you're not going to be standing firm. Some of you that are knocked down on the battlefield right now, that are wounded, hurting, some of you that are struggling, Hindsight should teach you, and I'm saying this out of love. Learn the lesson, look back and go, wow, I got trampled because I wasn't prepared. Some of us are just happy we made it out of that battlefield alive. Yep, I got divorced, I ruined that marriage, but I'm just through it. Forget them, they had all their issues, not me. I had no issues, they had all the issues, so I'm done with that. I'm good to go forward. And we didn't learn from that mistake and so now we haven't, we're not any more prepared for the next battle. That's why people get divorced multiple times. That's why people continue to struggle with the same, maybe it's an addiction or maybe it's a, a problem at work. I jump from job to job to job. Maybe it's, uh, you know, like I can't ever seem to keep friends. I have them for a little while and then they betray me. Maybe it's, it's something that's going on in you that you're also not learning what it is that God has for you to learn. Therefore, you're not really doing what it is that he has for you to do. James chapter one says this. 
And verse 2 through 4, it says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. When you see a battle coming, stop running away from the battle. Instead, consider it an opportunity for joy. Why? For, for you can know this, that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. It's only when you have a battle that you're actually going to get any better. We are so afraid of the fight. We're so afraid of the struggle. We never grow in our faith. It finishes this way. So let your faith grow. Let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Some of us think we're perfect now. (laughs) We are not. If that is part of your goals, if you have the New Year's resolution, I really want to be perfect, then you better start letting your faith grow in the battles. Start making sure that you go, hey, listen, God, that scares me. I was challenged to do this. I don't know why uh, this scares me so much, or I don't know how I'm going to do it, but you called me to walk into that battle. I'm going to do it. That's where your faith's going to grow. That's what's going to be what perfects you. The fact that we don't ever do that is one of the reasons that we're struggling so much. Let's move on, though. For the end of this story, I want to show you these last two things. He rescues Lot, and that's a really cool thing. He rescues him. It's a cool story. I know why the teachers didn't tell me this in Sunday school. I would have like just gone off in my own imagination playing out that battle scene. But the story afterwards is just as cool. He's on his way back, and the, the priest Melchizedek comes out. It's one of the first recordings that we ever have of anything like this. Here's a man of God who comes out and displays what the church is supposed to do. Hospitality, generosity, compassion. Abram used his men at his own risk to go out and try to rescue somebody. So this generosity, this this hospitality that Melchizedek offers is, is a beautiful picture of the church. Abram's response models for us where we should be as well. See, what Abram does is he gives Melchizedek one-tenth of everything that he captured. He captured it. Nobody else captured it. See, what happens is the king of, of uh, Sodom comes up and is like, hey, um, give me all the people that you rescued that belong to my city, and then just keep all the, the gold and the spoils for yourself. He's trying to strike a deal with him. The reason that that doesn't work is by the culture, by the standards of the day that were universal across the world, everything that Abram got was his to keep. It was his army, his plan, he was the leader. Every single person he captured was his slave if he wanted it. Every piece of gold, every piece of furniture, anything he got, that was all his. He didn't owe Sodom and Gomorrah anything. He didn't rob them. He didn't attack them. The Mesopotamian army did. They took all of their stuff, those guys then owned it. Abram went and attacked those guys, so all of the stuff he got from them is now his, and everybody knew that, that was where it was. But this politician, by the way, he's the new king, the old king died in the tar pits, so the new king's like, I got a deal for you. You keep all the stuff, just give me back the people. And he, he was just trying to work an angle, it, he didn't deserve any of it, and nobody could have said anything. Morally, legally, Abram owned all of that. And he's, this guy's just trying to, trying to get some of it back. I'm not faulting the, the, the king of Gomorrah, but he acts like he's entitled to it. Like, you just give me those people back, keep the other stuff. Like he's, giving, like he's making a deal for Abram. Abram's not dumb. He could have kept it all for himself, and nobody would have stopped him. Definitely not the king. So what do we see here about it? We see that he is blessed with a victory, and with a huge increase in a workforce and in finances, and he just gives it away. First off, he stops, and off the top of everything he's gotten, he's, he gives one-tenth to God. And he says, before I do anything with anything else, God, Melchizedek shows up and goes, thank God that you were safe and you were able to have this. And, and Abram's response is, yeah, thank God. Here, God, this is yours. And then with what's left, and here's where people get mad. They're like, yeah, I don't like this whole like, give one-tenth thing. Abram gave 100%. Are 
You're like, I don't, I don't know if I can give a percentage to God. Abram gave everything back. To, for what reason? What reason does Abram say he's given it all back? If you look, when he's talking to the king, he says, I don't want you to take any credit for any of the blessings I get. By the way, I get to take credit. If I really wanted to, I can take credit for everything I've got because I'm the only one that wasn't too chicken to go get it. But he doesn't say that. He goes, hey, bro, you can have everything down to the last sandal strap. I don't want it. Because when God blesses me, that comes from God, not on you. And if God, if I'm going to trust God to bless me, then I don't have to worry about me blessing me. Abram, it, see, you and I struggle with this because if we're Abram, we're like, well, I went and did all the hard work. I'm the one that put myself in danger. I earned this paycheck. But Abram has a bigger vision than what you and I have. He says, it's only by God's grace that I'm still alive to have that victory. I only was able to go into that victory with those, those men because God blessed me with those men. Some of you are like, yeah, I earned my paycheck. You earned your paycheck because God gave you the body to go work that job. Yeah. You're still breathing and your heart's still beating because God has allowed that to happen. And when you say, I'm taking mine, God's lucky that I, I give him even the time of day. God's like, you can lose that real quick, but he's much more gracious than I am. You and I are so selfish when it comes to our stuff. Abram models for us what it looks like to be open-handed, what it looks like to be generous. And this is what I think, if Lot was to sit there and look and see Abram do that, regardless of, and we, we have some other stories for Lot, you gotta go read the rest of Genesis, he does some other stuff later, but one thing that Lot would have to notice about that exchange and about the character of his uncle, he would have to look at that, and he would notice that great generosity comes from genuine humility. The humility that Abram has to say, the only reason we have any victory, the only reason we can stand here with all of this plunder, all of the spoils of war, is because God is allowing it, and therefore you can have it all, because I would rather have God's continued blessing and have none of the treasure than to keep the treasure and lose God's blessing. And by the way, nobody praises or knows the king of Sodom or Gomorrah, but to this day, millions upon millions upon millions of people have been blessed by Abraham. Well, on that day, the king of Sodom and Gomorrah, he sure won it. What did he win? He got some treasures back and his people. And nobody knows him. Nobody talks about him. He had no positive impact. But Abram is still praised to this day. And one of them trusted God, and one of them just looked at what they could get. The Bible says this in Luke chapter 12, sell your possessions and give to those in need. This will store up treasures for you in heaven and the purses of heaven never get old. They never develop holes. It's like saying, hey, you're, this is a bank account that can't ever go bad. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal and no moth can destroy when you lay up stuff in eternity. When you care more about the stuff in the, the house of God is what it's saying here. Then it says this passage, which is incredibly true. It's hard for us to acknowledge, but it says, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Because the, the thing that you pursue after, the thing that you love the most is going to be the thing that you invest in the most. You can tell me you love God. You can tell me you love your family. You can tell me whatever. Just show me what you spend the most money on. That'll actually be what you love the most. The thing you love the most will be the, the thing that you put your, your treasure in. And for a lot of us, it's ourselves. I just want a nice retirement. I just want to make sure I'm comfortable when I get older. So we put all the money on us because the thing that we love most is us. And I'm not saying don't be wise, and I'm not saying don't plan ahead, and I'm not saying don't love your family and be generous. All those things are great. I'm just saying know where your actual heart is and know that God isn't actually after your money. He wants your heart. You and I are just the ones that tie our heart directly to our money. It says this in Malachi chapter 3. It's the only time in the Bible where God says that we're allowed to test him. So you might want to take note of that. He says this, Bring all the tithes into the storehouses so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do this, if you'll actually give to God, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I'll open up the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, exclamation point, Put me to the test. Test me. 
See what I'll do for you when you trust me more than you trust yourself. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says this, you must each decide in your, in your own heart how much to give. This is not a me telling you what you have to do. This is God saying, listen, you have to decide in your own heart. One-tenth, 50%, 1%, don't get hung up on that. You have to decide in your own heart. God will tell you, hey, here's where you need to be at. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. Long before COVID, our church decided we would never pass an offering plate because our goal is never to pressure somebody into giving money. You give because you want to, and if you don't want to, keep it. I trust that God will take care of Harbor Church through the people who want to support it. And if you don't want to, that's between you and God. I love you enough to tell you, I, I know he wants your heart. You have to decide if you're going to have your heart attached to the money the way, the way that most of us do and have to struggle through. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. God loves a person who gives cheerfully. If your face looks like this, oh, keep it. God loves it when you're like, sweet, I get to give back. And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Notice that verse says you will have everything you need, not everything you want. You'll always have everything you need and plenty to, left, and plenty to still share. And as the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. This is a, a thing that Abram teaches us that I'm just going to leave you with that. His generosity reflected his humility. He had more reasons to be proud than any person we read about in that passage, and he's the most humble one there. He gives freely. And I think Lot watched that. And as much as I would have said that's the most impressive thing that Lot would have seen would have been the humility of his uncle to be so generous with his allies and the king and everybody, I don't think that's the thing that, that probably st stuck the most in, in, in Lot's mind. I think if you could run up and run, and run into Lot a couple months later, Maybe he's sitting in the shambles of what used to be his house before the army burned it down. Maybe he was trying to rebuild. I don't know. We do know that he ends up still living in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he ends up starting a family there and so forth and so on. So he definitely rebuilds. But if you had caught him a few months later, I wonder what he, he would have said he remembered most. And I think it would be remembering that moment right before he was rescued how bleak it felt to be tied up maybe his hands were in front of him his hands were behind him maybe he was blindfolded maybe he had chains on him maybe he was chained to other prisoners he saw his stuff his furniture his flocks his friends just being taken going everywhere and he's just sitting there going i'm being sold into slavery that's what's going to happen to me i'm going to spend the rest of my life which may be 10 more minutes 10 more days or 10 more years i'm going to be a slave to somebody who doesn't care about me this is the end of my life as i know it and he was sitting there thinking that discouraged depressed sad and then somebody sneaks in and goes hey we're here to rescue you We're taking care of business right now. Let's go. What? Yeah, your uncle said, come home. Abram's here. He said, yeah, you're not going to be a slave today. What? You kidding me? Can you imagine? We, we talk about singing a hallelujah. I'm like, oh, right about. See you guys. No slave today. Drop these chains. Like he would have. If that would have been you and you asked me, what did you learn about that experience? I'd have been like, never before in my life have I appreciated how, what it feels like to not be in, in ropes and bondage and in, in chains. Never before in my life did I really understand how sweet it was to be rescued. I think Lot would tell you that it takes, it takes being in captivity to appreciate the rescue. And some of us, this is what I'm leaving you with, so, so lean in for one second. Some of us have been stuck in captivity 
and we were at that place where Lot was, where you're going, this is the end. I've got nothing less left to live for. There's no hope. I'm just going to be a slave for the rest of my life. And maybe you feel like it's a slave to an addiction. Maybe you feel like it's a slave to debt. Maybe you feel like it's a slave to broken relationships. Maybe you feel like it's, you're, you're going to be a slave to a health issue. Maybe you feel, and I, I don't know, you, 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 you fill in the blank. But we get to that place where we're going, no. There's nothing left. And the thing Lot would tell you, he would go, it's never been so sweet to have a rescuer. You have to be tied up and done. You have to be at your wit's end before you can go, man, that is awesome. Because if you had asked me about my Uncle Abram two days earlier, I'd be like, yeah, he's this old guy. He gives me a hard time about all the stuff I do. But in that moment, Oh, thank you. Abram, my rescuer, my savior. And you want to know what Abram is a picture of? He's a picture of a God who leaves everything and says, hey, I'm coming to get you. He's a picture of a God who says, I don't care how scary and how big and how dark that army is. I'm going to come set you free. And this is what we get from this story if you'll just lean into it. If you'll look back at some of the things that God has done in your life, he has demonstrated time and time again that he is the kind of God that will leave heaven and come to earth to rescue you. He's the kind of God that says, whatever trouble you've gotten yourself into, however deep the dumpster fire is, I can reach into it. However bad it's gotten for you, it's not too much for me. This is what it says in Psalms chapter 91, verse 14. It says, the Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. If you say, I I don't know how God would rescue me today. You don't understand how much bad stuff I've done, Pastor Josh. That message may work for somebody with a small problem, but my problem's pretty heavy. Remember what it says about him and Peter. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, he personally carried our sins. The thing that you think is too heavy, and by the way, it is too heavy for you. The stuff you've done that you can't carry anymore, he carried that on his back on the way to the cross he nailed your dumpster fire your issues the thing that is so dark and dirty and depressing and scary about your life he carried it and he carried it to the cross and he died for it why because by his wounds you're healed it's because he did this that you get to go free pastor i don't know how to take advantage of that I don't know what to do with this message. I don't know how to respond. I definitely need rescue, but I don't know. I don't know what that really looks like for me. I think the psalmist says it best. Chapter 71, verse 2, he says this. This is his, this is what he says. This is what you should say. Save me. Rescue me. You always do what's right, God. Turn your ear and listen to me. Set me free. What if that was your prayer? For some of you, you need that for the very first time. It's called salvation. Set me free from my sin because God, I ain't got it and I'm going to hell without you. I need something bigger than me. Save me, set me free. Some of you already have a relationship with Jesus. So what you need to learn from Lot and Abraham, you need to learn that that same God that went after Lot, that went after everybody around you is still going hey i set you free and then you went right back into your sin i'm still coming after you i can't tell you how many times i've asked for forgiveness for the same stupid thing but god is gracious and if you've fallen back into sin if you've allowed yourself to be chained back again by your your mistakes maybe it's your attitude maybe it's some actions you've taken some stuff that you shouldn't have done but you you did anyways Get set free today. It's not enough just that God died for you and and gives you a home in heaven. He doesn't want you enslaved here on earth. Set yourself, be set free. Say, God, give me something better than this. I'm going to pray and I'm going to close this out because 
I went really long and I apologize, but I just wanted you to know the most important part of the story. And I say that because I'm, I'm, I'm so hurting from the people that are enslaved right now. The conversations I'm having almost every week is somebody somewhere chained to something. I want, I want more people to know that there's a rescuer. I want you to have that hope right now as you listen to this. There's freedom, but you have to claim it. That's the power of this story, and that's the power of Jesus Christ on the cross. Is the one who sets us free. Would you let me pray over you? I'll pray out loud, and you pray right where you're at. God, save me. God, rescue me. Just like Psalm 71 says, God, I need you more than I need anything else. Set me free. Somebody here needs to pray that for the first time. Somebody right now in this moment needs to ask Jesus Christ to set them free from their sin. I can't do it for you. I'll pray for you, but you have to make that decision in your own heart. God, set me free. God, save me from this. I need a new hope. I need a new plan. If you'll invite Jesus Christ into your life, he says he'll come. He'll be your Lord and Savior, and he'll give you something better than what you have right now. He'll give you hope and a future and a home in heaven. You have to do that. You have to make that decision. And if you would say, I've already said that, then as I pray, why don't you pray and ask God to help you remember that you're free and to stay free and to help set other people free. You have a mission and opportunity to see your friends and your family, your neighbors and your coworkers to be set free from their bondage. You might be the very person that God has put in their life to help them find that freedom. What are you doing? As I pray, you pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you. Thank you for this story. It's not an easy one to read, but God, it's so, it's so true that we get so distracted. This world pulls our, our attention away from you so easily. Forgive us of the times that we think that our safety is more important. We think that our own happiness is more important. Forgive us for burning relationships with people. Forgive us for pursuing ourself all the time. God, for, forgive us for being so selfish and self-centered. God, this world doesn't need more fighting. It doesn't need more greed. God, it needs people who are humble and generous and loving and willing to go rescue others. God, would you use me? Would you use the people right now under the sound of my voice? Would you use us as instruments to, to proclaim rescue? God, everybody here has a family member or a friend that's hurting, that's, that's held captive by something. God, would you, would you help us? Would you, would you show them what real freedom looks like? Would you use us to encourage them to find that? God, would you be with the person who needs salvation right now? We ask this and we claim this in your precious and holy name. Amen.